my favorite part of the Ocean City is just coming across the bridge in the morning and smelling the sea air and the seagulls just flying over. I just love that soft air smell. It's just like Maryland's own siren song, this music of the ocean. It draws us in and it holds us tight. It's all about sand and waves, a cooling beach breeze on a steamy July day. It all makes going down the ocean a habit we just can't quit. You come across that Route 50 bridge, there's no other feeling like it. You're on vacation again. You feel like you're in a whole nother world. All the stress goes away. You sit out on the back deck, watch the sunrise, the sunset, the people going by. You make sure you come up and fly your kites on the windy day. You sit on the beach and just watch the waves. And it's, it's so relaxing. It's entertainment and it's tradition. It's a summertime ritual that brings us back over and over again. Back to the sounds. Back to the sights. Back to a feast for the senses. It's like a combination of all these smells. It's a blend that you just can't bottle. It's a getaway. It's a road trip. It's families and kids and memories made. A time to remember the past and celebrate the future. It becomes a lifestyle, it really does. I lived in Baltimore all my life, and I always wished to move to the ocean, because everybody there said, down the ocean, hon, and that's where I wanted to be. So come along with us as we make our way to the sand, the waves, the boardwalk, and the bay. And the characters, the faces and places that make it all down the ocean, hon. Down the Ocean, hon, is made possible in part by the MPT Foundation New Initiatives Fund, established by Irene and Edward H. Kaplan, and by If you come up early in the morning, you're going to see people walking. They're basically up here to watch the sunrise. And as the morning progresses a little bit, more and more people come out. You start to see people riding bikes. One of the real popular things in Ocean City is riding your bike on a boardwalk. And it has always been that way. It's just something very special. People just have a good time doing it, you know? <laughs> Beachside in Ocean City. It's a morning playground, and Alan Sklar's been in the middle of it all for more than 35 years. This buckle has two, re two catches, not just... I really enjoy interacting with the customers. Everybody's different. Some people have a sense of humor, some people don't. But I try to bring that out in them. Right. Now, when you push the Surrey backwards to turn it around, all the pedals are gonna turn. You know, after you start talking with them for a minute, they loosen up. So, we don't want any mash feet. So when you're in reverse, be careful. Okay. Okay. And when they leave here, they have a nice feeling about what they've done. We do the bike ride probably once or twice a week while we're here just to get some exercise and move around a little bit. It's such a, such a great place to ride. I mean, just so much to see and it's just a good ride. I like to be able to go all the way to the end without having to walk. It takes forever to get all the way down there, so the bike is a quick way to get down there and see everything. The ocean, right there beside you as you're riding along, the sun coming up, I mean, what could be better than that? It's awesome. Since the first wooden boards were laid in the sand for an impromptu boardwalk in the late 1800s, Oceanside has been the place to be. 
What we know today as Ocean City actually started in 1869 when businessman Isaac Coffin built a small boarding house along the shore. Six years later, the first hotel, the Atlantic, opened on Wicomico Street. At the time, its 400 rooms were the northernmost boardwalk attraction. It had no electricity, it had no running water, and it filled up immediately because people wanted to come to the beach. They wanted to come to the ocean. It wasn't long before other pioneers followed suit, like George Connor with his boardwalk restaurant on Division Street, a first for the city. My grandmother started working there, and then um, the inevitable romance happened. They married, and they had three boys the next seven years. George's untimely death forced his wife to run the restaurant and boarding house. She was so successful, she later bought another property a few blocks north, a place at the time that seemed worlds away. I told my grandmother she was an idiot because it was too far down the beach. It was at 3rd Street, and that nobody would go down there, and it was going to be a failure, and she was crazy. She forged ahead anyway, and as Ocean City grew, the town's northern edge began to swell. But growth was limited by what could be a long and tedious trip. The biggest obstacle for some, the Chesapeake Bay. For a trip from the west, the choices were few. Either drive around the bay on the northern route, or wait in line for the slow ride across. It might take you as much as, as six hours to get from Baltimore all the way to Ocean City, counting the time that you were on the, the steamboat and then the railroad, or uh, once you're driving. And then it happened. The third longest bridge in the world, spanning Chesapeake Bay, is ready for service. And former Maryland Governor... The opening Lane of the Bay Bridge Governor in 1952 changed everything. As the cars begin to roll over the brand new bridge, each motorist is saving 125 miles from the eastern to the western shore of Maryland, along the arterial... From that point on, you've got a, a, a continuous road system. Uh, going all the way from wherever it is, Baltimore, Washington, uh, the Annapolis area, uh, all the way to Ocean City. Traffic really began building in the 50s and, and in the 1960s. In the early 70s, they opened a second span of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge so that now we've got five lanes crossing the bridge instead of, instead of just the two that were there initially. This sleepy town blossomed almost overnight into a summer destination for tens of thousands of sun seekers. And the city grew and grew. When I was growing up as a teenager, the town ended at 15th Street. When I came back from the service, there were uh, motels all along the ocean front or apartment houses, restaurants along the coastal highway, and they had just uh, like onions sprouted out of the sand. Ocean City simply grows and grows, and what you find along the beachfront is uh, uh, the larger and larger hotels. High-density lodging quickly sprouted along the waterfront. There's a little bit of everything, and if you've seen it expand from not just having accommodations like hotels and motels, uh, but now to condominiums and high-rises. Each summer, the population here swells from 7,500 to more than 350,000 visitors a month. With a first-class boardwalk, a wide range of hotels, condominiums, and cottages, and a pristine beach, it's one of the most popular ocean resorts on the East Coast. This is second to none as a family resort. Sun, sand, surf, and safety. It can't be matched anywhere else. But there's more than just the beach to lure Ocean City lovers to the water's edge. One of the best rides at the boardwalk was this little kid's ride called the Whip. You would go around this little circle and then the car would, would come down the circle and then it would whip around really quickly and you know, the kids would go really fast around the circle and scream, and I, I just love that ride. 
Anyone that's been here knows the Ferry Whip because their kids demand to ride it over and over and over again. Crimper Rides has thrilled vacationers here for more than a hundred years. I'm fifth generation. I uh, was my great-great-grandparents that first came to visit Ocean City from Baltimore. They fell in love with it, and then in uh, 1912, they got this merry-ground. When I'm having a bad day at work, there's nothing I like more than coming over here, getting on the merry-ground, walking around, talking to customers. And if I do it two or three times a day, I promise I'll hear the story of a grandmother with her granddaughter riding a horse, telling the story of riding that same horse with her grandmother. If you look at like this, this design here, it's got flowers in it, you want to... Three generations of crimpers have entrusted the care of this special family treasure to Maria Schlick, originally hired with her brother to restore the fabulous horses that race the carousel. It usually raises the grain. They brought it back to life. Some of the broken legs and stuff they were able to reattach or, or recarve. That's a foot off of one of Trimper's horses. They say that it's like 1912. Okay. I use metallic colors on this one. This one's always one of the favorites for all the little boys. They're always looking for the dragon. Some of them we would wait to, for the ride to be over and someone else get off so they can just ride this one. But it, the dragon, I always like a dragon because it's so big. Everyone always jumps along with their, their child and is happy to tell you about it. Oh, it's our first ride. Oh, it's his first ride. And, and I'm happy to hear it. Actually, some of our rides have height limits. And you can see the disappointment in kids' faces when they hit that limit and they can no longer ride. They're disappointed. But uh, you got to follow the rules, so they move on to the, to the bigger rides outside. I'll never forget this, my, my twin sister, Wendy. We had just gotten rainbow flip-flops, and we were in the rotor, and I'm looking across at my sister, and her shoes are off. Like, one of them's sticking to the wall, and one of them's on the floor, that the floor is now, like, five feet below us. And the floor comes, and of course, it eats the flip-flop. And she was just crestfallen. We'd stand underneath, and you see, all of a sudden, you'd hear all this pling, 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 and it was the sound of coins coming out of everybody's pockets, falling off all the rides, and you'd be down there like, yeah, 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 you know. And if, and if, it, and if it fell outside of the area of the, uh, of the ride itself, it was fair game. So as little kids are down there going, yeah, spin them harder, spin them faster. I liked the Matterhorn. Yeah, the Matterhorn, which was AKA, kind of like the Himalaya, same thing, the cars would go around and, and I would make the uh, mistake of, of always wanting to sit on the outside and the heavier people would sit on the inside and then I'd wind up getting crushed as it spun around and you're like, you know, you know, save me, save me. The guy running the ride would say, do you want to go faster? And everybody would scream, yeah! Still to come, a look at a truly eccentric boardwalk fixture. But first, a little snack. I came to celebrate this beautiful July 4th weekend and have some of the best french fries of my life. When we came as kids, you always got to eat stuff on vacation that you didn't get to eat any other time. You're on vacation. You know, when you're on vacation, you know, you kind of let your guard down. You're totally uninhibited, you're relaxed. That's what you come here for. So I can sleep a little later, I can stay out a little later. There's no calories on anything you eat on vacation, so you eat stuff that you don't eat when you're at home. If I'm going to eat something, it would be Thrasher's fries with vinegar and salt and pepper. They're the best. No one beats Thrasher's fries. And the other thing, and we bring them back to date now, we've got a big bucket of the uh, Fisher's popcorn. If you haven't had Fisher's popcorn, you've got to do that. It's a staple of Ocean City. It's got a really good flavor to it. Right now we're using, uh, we got this constant feed popper and it's uh, popping the popcorn nice and big as you can see. This will run all day long if we need to. It starts at one end, it takes about a minute and a half or so for the kernels to, to pop and drop out. And we'll use that to add in with the caramel and have the caramel popcorn. Rounding out this boardwalk food triumvirate, salt water taffy. A lot of times people buy it for people that are watching their home while they're away on vacation. The taffy is mixed, 
pulled, stretched, and wrapped right in the back of the store. We make, say, anywhere between 3,500 and 5,000 pounds a day. Uh, right here on this street corner, it's like kind of turkey on Thanksgiving. When you come to the beach, you have to get saltwater taffy and caramel corn. Two eighty-five north of Durham, coming around. While many like to tackle the two-mile wooden walkway on foot, others prefer to experience their boardwalk adventure on the Ocean City Tram. When you start at the southern end of the boardwalk, you're going to find the amusements and all of those type of things, more of the retail shops, things like that. Once you get past 9th Street, it's going to be more hotels, motels. They may have stores con connected with them, but it's more of a residential area of the boardwalk. My favorite part is uh, from 4th Street, basically, to, uh, to 18th Street. It's where the action is. People love to ride the tram because they can actually sit back and just take in all the sights and sounds. You know, they're not watching where they're walking. And you know, it's amazing. But if I got on the tram today and rode the boardwalk, I'd see something I never saw before. We would ride the tram just for a, a leisurely break to see what's changed on the boardwalk. You ride up and you ride down. Been doing it for seven years. You get to know people, just a lot of interesting people. And you have a good time with them. A lot of nice people out here. And we're usually in a very good mood. You won't find anyone on the boardwalk in a better mood than Joe Crowart. Welcome to Ocean Gallery World Center, yeah! He's been called eccentric and self-promoting. Even the P.T. Barnum of the art world. Joe Crowart is probably a little bit of each. So there's something about the energy and the excitement of the boardwalk that really energized me. This is the place to be recognized. This is the place where the action was. And it was exciting. Everything on the boardwalk is screaming for attention. You have to scream louder than anybody else. That's what Ocean Gallery does. <laughs> First, there's the outfit. Now you can spend three or four hundred dollars on a suit or more and nobody recognizes it, but a fifty dollar tuxedo has done me well. Then there's the car. Before it became the Batmobile was her family car. But this is the siren song that draws you in. Welcome to Ocean Gallery. Thank you. Okay. If you need, uh, need any help, this is Ocean City's only recycled building. It's paint can lids, paint brushes. This is actually a beam from an old barn in Baltimore County from the 1870s. Now everybody walks by, and I think people go, wonder what that crazy building is. You know, I can't remember when Ocean Gallery wasn't on the boardwalk. That's how long it's been here. And the whole idea is that art is a part of life. It's so simple and so basic. That's what I'm all about. That he's also all about entertaining is plain to see in the TV commercials he makes. I do TV commercials completely myself. One year, um, Got an idea to do a bicycle jump off the roof. We took it up on the roof, put this tuxedo on a dummy, taped the dummy to the bike, and they threw this bike and the dummy off the roof. My crew did it the first time perfectly. They did it three more times because they had so much fun throwing the bike off the roof. By the time we got the bike back to the guy, the wheels were square. <laughs> you gotta present something that they can't find anywhere else in the world. Something Joe Crowart and his Ocean Gallery do very well. There's more OC characters to come right after some beach time.
I love to swim. I could stay out in the water all day. It's a sanctuary for some, a social scene for others. Ocean City's beach is a 10-mile sandbox of play. Its wide, white sand beaches stretch for miles. It's also home to an eclectic assortment of beach connoisseurs. There's the lugger, the renter, the builder, the tenter. No more umbrellas. <laughs> you see people setting up rows of tents to have their whole family there. Some people like to be right along the water so they can watch their kids or have their feet in the water. Some like to be back a little farther. Preparing to come to Ocean City as a family, we had to have buckets and shovels and bathing suits and towels and, you know, just gobs of toys for the beach. There are some that just like to get out there and read a book and quiet time and watch the ocean. Some that like to sit in the water. Some that are in the water the entire time. Ocean City is a 10-mile stretch of broad sand that hugs Maryland's short Atlantic coastline from Delaware in the north to the southern inlet at Assateague. It rests on a barrier island with the Sinopuxet Bay on one side and the Atlantic on the other, draws that have brought people here for generations to sun, swim, relax, and just have fun. It energizes you, and the smell of the salt air from the Atlantic and being able to watch everybody out there and just feel the breeze as you're outside, it's something special. At first, beach vacations were a thing of the rich and well-to-do. But soon, going down the ocean became a welcome part of summertime life. The original days, families came for the summer. They came with their trunks and um, to get out of the city because it was hot and it was dangerous. There was a lot of disease because of the, the heat and the lack of good sanitation. Over time, the number of families starting traditions here grew almost as fast as the beach itself. I came to Ocean City a lot when I was younger and then didn't get to come for several years, uh, just wasn't able to do it. Always loved the beach, started coming back about five years ago, and it's become my second home. My day at the beach starts early afternoon. When we come down, the chairs are on the beach. Uh, normally we have radios listening to the wave. In and out of the water, if the water is nice, and it's warm on the beach. Uh, and we just kind of hang out on the beach, talk, water bottles, radio, watching people, and then whatever happens. We think this is a great location. It is. You're close enough, you can walk down to the craziness down there, but you're far enough. Once people get out on the beach, I know it happens to me, you end up talking to the people next to you and everybody around you, everybody gets, you know, gets along. You're all here for the same reason, just to have a good time, enjoy your friends and family. My family started coming to Ocean City in the mid-60s. John Preslepa's long-held family beach traditions continue to this day. We would rent bikes uh, a couple mornings a week and, and, and ride the boardwalk. During the season, uh, you're only allowed to ride on the boards up till 10 in the morning, so we would uh, you know, probably start riding around 8 o'clock in the morning and, and ride for a couple hours. We would usually get to the beach uh, probably before the lifeguards were on duty, uh, 9, 9.30 in the morning to get a good spot up front. We would stay all day. As kids, we were probably busy playing the entire time we were there, either you know in the water or playing in the sand, running around, probably driving our parents crazy. John's bond with the beach eventually brought him back all summer long as a member of the famous Ocean City Beach Patrol. Head on out. You're going to be getting that victim off the sled. Bring them in. Head on out. They're committed to one thing, and that's the safety of the people that are on the beach. There you go. Members of this elite corps are in tip-top shape, motivated and highly trained. The type of training we get is far more intense and actually exists, whereas when I started, basically, if you could run and swim, they told you a couple things and put you on a stand. Right now is your opportunity to show Captain Butch Arbin has been part of the Ocean City Beach Patrol for more than 41 years and in charge for the last 17. You know, what it took to do this job before you took the test. 
We do an all-day test, and we send them through a one-week-long surf rescue academy, three weeks of supervised probation, and what we had today was our rookie graduation. The rigorous training pays off. I think we're going on probably five years without a drowning death while we're on duty. Early attempts at surf rescue in the 1800s centered on assistance to shipwreck survivors. Volunteers would patrol the beach looking for ships in trouble. It really didn't work so well because they had a hard time finding volunteers and then they'd go and open the boatroom doors and oh, somebody borrowed the boat and not brought it back. In 1878, the Federal Life Saving Service was formed and station houses were built up and down the coast as a result. They didn't have horses in the early days, so they had to pull the equipment to the scene of the wreck, then launch the ship to effect a rescue. So it was when men were made of iron and the boats were made of wood. <laughs> when coastal swimming became popular in the early 1900s, seaside towns would hire locals to walk the sand and rescue swimmers in trouble. Eventually, formal beach patrols were established the first one here being in 1930. Then they decided as they started becoming a tourist place, they built a boardwalk, they needed a beach patrol. It started out with a small handful of people. Today, the beach patrol's 200 lifeguards perform between two and 4,000 rip current rescues a season. Plus, parents count on them to find lost kids. What's coming across radio now is we have a lost child. Last girl from 36th Street, same Ellen, age seven, orange and yellow. That's probably the fifth or sixth lost child already today, depending on the wind, depending on conditions, and crowds on the beach. Um, you know, those numbers can go up. So right there, we just had three lost kid messages. That's what we were talking about. The Beach Patrol has a 100% success rate with finding lost kids. Uh, the current is driven north to south. Leading some families to adopt their lifeguard by returning to the same beach every year. If we move a lifeguard, sometimes people say, where did you put my lifeguard? You know, a couple of years ago, we had a guard at uh, 50th Street, and the kids had created a dance for him. And every day when he came out, they would do the Kirby dance. John Prisleppo worked here in the 70s, fulfilling a lifelong dream. I surprised myself and, and passed the test, and I ended up uh, lifeguarding at 136th Street for three summers, and probably the best job I ever had in my life. It was a real gratifying job. Our people are significant, and that's why our people keep coming back, because you don't find significance in most careers, and this they have it. Steve DeKemper's been returning each summer for the past 25 years. So uh, I wanted something that was a different lifestyle choice. So when I was about uh, 20 years old, 21 years old, I did the tryouts and decided just to stay on. And um, uh, I've been doing it ever since. So a couple things to review. Yeah, These veterans are subject to the same physical skills tests as other guards, some who are half their age. Get up before the wave. First up, a 300-meter sprint on soft sand in under 65 seconds. Those that go over do not make the cut. Their swim stretches from the jetty to around the pier. That's 500 meters in the open rolling surf. Only if they complete the challenge within 10 minutes can they qualify for the beach patrol. And all guards must re-qualify every year, no exceptions. It's a long journey. On the other end of the spectrum are rookies like Abby Schaub. Hi girls, how are you today? Who has been working right. with the beach patrol since so she was 10. I did junior beach patrol like for seven awesome. summers. Do you guys know what rip currents are? Huh? Do you know what a rip current is? Have you ever been Now with the junior beach patrol program, we're getting kids as early as 10 years old. They have an opportunity at 14 to apply for a paid position in that program. Once they turn 17, they can take the test, get on the patrol. It's the most rewarding feeling ever to be able to, you know, say I, what, what you've been through and then just end up on the stand and start making a difference. 
it's something that until you're on it, it's hard to explain. But just the, the brotherhood and sisterhood of it, I mean, we're saving lives, we're out there making a difference. And I'm only 17 years old, not many other 17 year olds can say they, they've done that. So what's it take to become a member of the Ocean City Beach Patrol? What we're looking for in a guard is somebody, number one, that physically can do the job. If they can't physically do it, that's it. But physical is not enough. They have to have the right attitude. They need to be the kind of person that's a team player, that they can be counted on to back somebody else up. It's kind of like a, a, a symphony orchestra, where we have the different sections all play their parts. I'm kind of the director, and as everybody comes in when it's their turn to come in, we make wonderful symphonic music. Otherwise, we just get squeaks and uh, soloists, and we have no place for that. The beach is about tradition. It's about what you remember as a kid. You always remember your first time on the beach in Ocean City, and that experience just never seems to change. How many people can lay on the beach and not look up when they hear the sound of that airplane engine? It's you know, as timeless as the beach almost. Banner planes have been pulling aerial advertisements over the beaches for years. But it's not as easy as it looks. I enjoy it because you get up early of the morning when it's nice and peaceful, you're going across a field, it's enjoyable. It's real flying. We're on a grass strip, flying airplanes that are just by the seat of the pants flying. Home base for these beach storming cowboys is on the mainland, a few miles west of town. Pilots from all over the country apply for a handful of summertime jobs and what can be a dangerous assignment. We normally hire between five to seven pilots a year. They have to be endorsed by the FAA, and once they get endorsed, they can do it for life. But it is a special thing. Not everybody can do it. We have probably a 20% failure rate. We take a stock plane, we modify it for banner towing. Bigger propellers, bigger engines, eyebrow cowlings, multiple releases, mirrors. This is all the letters from A all the way to all the different symbols on the other side. It takes me about 45 minutes to an hour to do a banner depending on how short or long it is. I take it outside, I roll it up, and then we have gators where we take them out to the field and the boys go from there. Here, the lead ropes are strung between two poles that stand six feet off the ground. The plane will come in and the wheel should be, the front two wheels should be above these poles and the hook will swing through because they will snap out there at the cones. And the hook will swing through and catch, should catch the rope right about here and pull the rope right off the pole as they're climbing. Pilot takes off, gets in the air, drops a hook, checks it in his mirrors, comes in, comes in at 80 miles an hour. Right before he gets to the poles, he rotates, then climb out with the banner and go to the beach. Every time you pick it up, it's different. The wind's always different, the temperature's different. Just depending on how much fuel you have on the airplane, it's gonna react different when you snap. Not a lot of instruments and gauges and other stuff to distract you. It's just you and the airplane. And you get to fly along the beach at the low level and it's real flying. What kind of crowd do we have on the beach? Pretty good by all the big buildings though. We have a lot of will you marry me's, and one was, honey, I'm so sorry. And he spent like $1,800 that day apologizing to his wife. Jeez, she was twice as mad when she found out. <laughs> Sunrise in Ocean City a refuge of quiet and solitude. The morning sand is also a haven for rituals. Just ask Huber McCleary, an Ocean City fixture for nearly four decades. This is my 39th year. 
come out every morning. I've found false teeth on the Outer Banks. One time I found a couple bombs. <laughs> it was used for practice range during World War II. You know, that's a challenge. And there's always a hope I'm going to make the big find, you know. McCleary's gear includes the requisite metal detector. This one is pretty simple. There's no meters or anything on it. And a special secret weapon. If I get something deep that I think is good, I have a fold-away shovel that I just unpack that and dig down. A lot of times people come up and they ask me to look for things that they've lost. A lady lost a, a good diamond ring, and I hunted for almost two weeks. I couldn't find it, and I was ready to give up, and I found it. And what had happened, she had lost it near a trash can, and when they emptied the trash cans, they set it down on top of it. Today, the diamonds seem few and far between. There, there's a cheap ring, there's quarters, nickels, dimes. Years ago, I, I could get up to eight, ten dollars in the morning. Well, now it keeps me busy to get four or five. Perhaps in his Zen garden by the sea, the treasure isn't what you find buried in the sand after all, but rather in the hunt itself. Hey, guys, want to get these for the rest of the day? A few blocks away, in much the same fashion as he has for the past 35 summers, Drew Haw hustles down the beach with umbrellas and chairs in tow. Hard to imagine where those years went, but it's it's been a pretty good uh, pretty good summer occupation, if you will. You got to be in a business where you can have three months off a year, and there's not a whole lot of other professions that that allow that other than than teaching. Met my wife uh, in the summer of 1950. There, we're still married. George Hurley remembers fondly his carefree days as a beach boy. I got paid $20 a week, and that was before taxes, uh, seven days a week. The only, day, only time you got off was if it was raining and couldn't run an umbrella. I would report for work around 9 o'clock in the morning. My umbrellas would be stacked, and I would take them to the beach. You see a lot of people just kind of stick them like this and try to do this. The next step was to anchor the umbrella securely in the sand. The technique is timeless. So turn it upside down first. Kind of give it a little shake. And open. And then you want to make sure you rock it into the wind. So you want to always rock it into the wind. The wind's coming out of the south today. And rock it back and forth. And each time you rocked, it would to fall down another three or four inches. You know, you don't want to just kind of push it down. You want to really down till you really feel that thing get stuck in the, you'll feel a sticking point at some point. And then once you get to that sticking point, boom. I mean, this is manual labor. I mean, you're humping these umbrellas back and forth, back and forth. I mean, we put everything up, we take everything down. It's, it's major work. More fun in the sun is coming up. But first, even Ocean City's got waves with curls to ride. It can get world class here. You know, just world class beach breaks, as far as the eye can see, up and down the whole coast. It's not exactly Big Sur, but OC is home to some passionate surfers who've mastered the peculiarities of East Coast waves. Chris McKibben is one of the locals. Being a first time surfer might be kind of intimidating or kind of hard to get up on the board, but you'd be surprised, you know? You'd be surprised with the right teacher, the right board, and the right attitude, of course, you know? You're, you're gonna get it, you know, definitely. Once you really just get that first wave, and you get that feeling, I mean, you just, there's nothing like it. So it's just, it's addictive, you know? You just want more and more and more of that same thing. When it's good, it's really good. There's a lot of power. Lee Jarakis runs a surf shop on the boardwalk. And then by the time you go to Miami. A lot of guys from California, Florida, that are up here for work, and they'll, they'll take a weekend and come to the beach and, hey, you know, I want to see if I can surf here. And they're sometimes pleasantly surprised. You have a lot of people walking in your store that have nothing to do with surfing, just want to see what it is, and that can be really enjoyable. 
When they come in, they can go, okay, you know what, I don't really have to have a pair of shoes on in here, and you know, if I'm a little bit sandy, it's okay. And that stress from work and home life and just kind of melts away, and they go, you know what, get back to an even keel. You know, I think that's, that's a lot what surfing is. I mean, you know, I think you just get to kind of forget everything and let the, the nastiness of the world wash away. During the summer, before and after lifeguards are on duty, the entire beach is open to surfers. Otherwise, they can use special surf beaches that even come with their own specialized lifeguards. They rotate two blocks south every day. We have three surfing beaches during the weekdays. And the idea is, is, is give the surfers some beach that they can use. Um, and we go down the day before, the surf beach facilitators walk down, tell the people in the next beach it's going to be a surfing beach. So they're not surprised that day. They don't set up and then find out they can't swim right in front of where they're sitting. And then the next day, it's two blocks away. It's just a family environment here. And you know, it's just a lot of fun to hang on the beach. And people are, are starting to notice it. And the best times are when it's warm. You're with a couple friends. And the waves are you know, maybe chest high, you know, just fun little surf and just peeling right down the beach. They don't close out, great form. And you just catch wave after wave after wave. And you know, you can have the best time, best time of the summer. While surfers thrive on ocean energy, others are drawn to the relative calm of the bay. Besides the boardwalk and we've done all that, so we thought we'd try this. awesome thing about Ocean City, in addition to there being a huge beach here, it's, it goes on forever, um, is that there's so much to do. You know, there's so much to do here and, you know, a lot of it is, it's very nostalgic. It's the stuff you do every year. It's stuff that you look forward to and, you know, activities and, you know, mini golf and uh, all the different things that we do. Yeah. It's a money shot, right? <laughs> the different water sports and the, the activities, and even if you just want to go to the movies or bowling or all of that's fun for the family. It's a nice family resort and lots of, lots of things here to do as a family. First one this year. Yep. First one on board. Hooking a big one. It's a sight that's lured anglers to Ocean City since the very beginning. Are you gonna throw it back in or? This is to come out, have a good time with your family, maybe get lucky and catch a fish. Most most time we catch fish. It's more about having a good time than filling up your cooler and going home. Okay, We've been coming since I was six. I'm 62. Um, she always wins. <laughs> Are the little sisters fish better? It is. It is horrible when little sisters fish better. The whole family from across the country gathers and we all come to Ocean City for a week. We go fishing at least every day, sometimes twice, sometimes on a boat, sometimes off the pier or the dock. Oh, fish off. We target flounder most of the year, but we can also catch bluefish, rockfish, croakers. We've caught 53 species of fish on the boat. Typically, we catch more throwbacks than keepers. That's not always the case. But um, we want to get a picture for you to send home to the family, say, look, I went fishing on vacation, and I even caught a fish. Wasn't a flounder, though. Looked like a little blue, maybe. It's restful. It's peaceful. You get the islands and the birds, and look at the big houses. and. How can you not enjoy that, being out on the water? It's just gorgeous. Back at the dock, one of Ocean City's oldest restaurants is still welcoming seafaring diners after more than 75 years. My grandmother started breakfast in the morning for the fishermen. That They left to go offshore around 5 in the morning and they wanted something to eat, so she started opening up and fixing them breakfast. Talbot Street uh, area was the hub back in the day. Um, 
It was a fishing destination. My grandfather uh, caught and released the first white marlin off of Ocean City, and they used to bring fish in here and weigh the fish here. It was always the center of activity back in the day. Some fishing days are lucky, and some are not. But if you don't happen to catch your dinner, chances are you won't go hungry. For many, many, many years, my family's favorite was Phillips Crab House. And we would, we would always go there, maybe more than once while we were here. Favorite restaurants are the crux of any Ocean City visit. And steamed crabs are anxiously awaited at least once a vacation. While the Maryland blue crab is claws down an OC vacation favorite, lots of chefs in town are serving summer dishes with a decidedly local flair. Trying to grow a large variety, just about everything, you know, and, and a few rows of this and a few rows of the other, you might say, because there's always, always a demand for something. Victor and Sue Birch have operated their roadside stand for more than 40 years and local restaurants are first in line for their fresh harvest. Sunset Grill comes uh, four or five times a week, and then I sell to Fresco's over in Ocean City, Pino and Karen Tomaselli. This time of the year, I try to use whatever it's in season. I enjoy if I step to Mrs. Birch. Her husband goes in the back and, okay, I just picked this in this fresh eggplant. I just picked some zucchinis. I just picked the tomatoes. It doesn't get no better than that. You know that the stuff has been just picked by you know the day, and, and it's, it's so fresh, so you know, so full of flavors, and and I, I enjoy it very much. And so do the chefs' customers. <laughs> when the sun begins to sink. The Bayside heats up as spectators jockey for a good view of perhaps the greatest light show of all. At Fagers Island, the sunset soundtrack is always the 1812 Overture. It's Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture, and it's done by the Cincinnati Philharmonic uh, Orchestra. They're the ones that have uh, the digital cannons, and it's our preferred copy. Each night, Ken Jenkins briefly breaks from his role as bartender to provide audio accompaniment to nature's visual extravaganza. It's 15 minutes of culture, and it coincides with the sunset. When the sun touches the horizon, there's three minutes, exactly three minutes to go, and that's like when the first set of cannons go off in the, in the, uh, in the 1812 overture, and it, that kind of signals uh, whether you're close or not, and then ends with the flurries of cannons as well, and that's kind of like the, gets everybody's attention. The next one is the one that matters the most, probably. It's a whole new night in Ocean City, Maryland. With the sun now below the horizon, the revelry turns inside as Ocean City's nightlife comes alive. The great thing about Ocean City is everybody's mind is right coming down here. Everybody wants to party. They're here to party. Because of the memories in this town. I mean, you know, places like the Paddock, the Party Block, Fager's Island, uh, Secrets, uh, the Moose. We got a week where we're not working and we can do what we want to do. And Purple Moose is one of those nightlight spots that people like to go to. Back in the day, in the 75 and 80s, I mean, this was it. Ocean City Purple Moose Saloon was the nightclub, was the place to go and drink. You have entertainment everywhere. We've got a karaoke bar, I think, on 33rd Street. That's the sand bar. You've got Fagers Island that does a more modern rock, but also has great deck parties on Monday. And DJ Batman plays there. This town creates memories. And, uh, you know, people like the consistency of that. The consistency is good.
as night comes and the sun sets and the lights become more apparent on the boardwalk, I think the lights and the noises and the people enjoying the rides and the occasional scream, I think that just adds to the excitement of the boardwalk. In the evening, it comes alive, infused with energy and awash in a magnificent kaleidoscope of colors. I think it's the greatest place and the nicest boardwalk because there's such a variety of things to do. It all spells fun, and I think people come here to relax and have fun, and I think that's what the boardwalk's all about. Our tradition was uh, just, you know, walking, walking down the boards every night. This is where everybody wants to be. They want to be on the boardwalk at night. They want to walk the boardwalk. They want to grab their french fries, their hamburgers, their milkshakes. They want to come down to the pier, to the rides. That's just part of the whole experience, and the evening hours are taken up by people just enjoying being outside, enjoying the boardwalk. People watching at night, it just can't be beat. It's the best. It's the greatest sidewalk in America. Absolutely, the boardwalk in Ocean City. And it wouldn't be the boardwalk without the motley entertainers, artists, and street performers scattered up and down. They're not something you're gonna see at home, so they really fit into that unique characteristic that people love about Ocean City. Down the ocean, honey. At night, the rides and games magically transform the boardwalk into an enchanted world of sound and motion. The pier has really grown and developed, and, and they've added a lot of rides to Jolly Roger on the pier, and I think that's probably becoming uh, more and more of a popular amusement spot. I would come with my family, we would go down to the pier, my brother wanted to go to the arcade, I'm a ride person. So it was the Ferris wheel or the rides on the pier. Lots of lights and sounds and carnival games and something for everybody, really, any age kid. It was a ride that my parents didn't want me to ride and we had a friend with us that weekend and she went with me on the ride and I lost my perspective on the ride, I couldn't figure out, you know, if I was up or down or upside down or right side up. My kids love to play skee-ball. They love to, they'll sit there for hours and just play and play and play. And it just thrills them when the tickets start coming out of the machine. They just get so excited, like, Mom, I got more tickets, Mom, I got more tickets. It doesn't matter if you're five years old or 105 years old, there's something somewhere on the boardwalk. Tonight, the boardwalk overflows. As revelers gather to watch fireworks on the season's busiest day, the 4th of July. It was a tradition every year. Uh, we usually came down on the weekend of the 4th of July so we could see the fireworks. Everything still, still feels like the days of old, from the street lights to the smells. It's still, Ocean City is just a classic, a classic American beach town. It's my other hometown. I feel very close to it. I have a lot of friends here still, and it's just my other hometown. Ocean City will always be an indelible image in my mind. There are things that I will remember for the rest of my life from being down Ocean City. What you're accomplishing is building the memory. You're accomplishing having the sensation of sharing it with your children and grandchildren. That tradition still hasn't changed a lot. Fun in the sun. Ocean City is just fun, pure fun in the sun, special memories that will live with you uh, for a lifetime. If memories are made in Maryland, then dreams come true in Ocean City during that one glorious, relaxing week. Down the ocean, hon. Down in the ocean, hon. Down 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 the ocean, hon. We're going to have some fun in the Maryland sun. Down the ocean, hon, was made possible in part by the MPT Foundation New Initiatives Fund, established by Irene and Edward H. Kaplan, and by